Hello guys and welcome to TGN the Game Nerd, the show where I talk about roleplay games and today we're going to be playing 9 Hours, 9 Persons, 9 Doors. In the last episode, if you don't remember, we went ahead and made our way through the second class cabin and there were a lot of funny moments in that episode, so if you haven't seen it, definitely go check it out. And in this episode, since we've now made our way out, we see two elevator looking doors right here and we're just going to go around and investigate and see if there's anything we can find. And they step through the door to find themselves in a wide hallway. Junpei, June, Lotus, and Santa stopped for a moment and looked at their surroundings. A short distance away, a metal grate extended across the width of the hallway. They took hold and shook, but it refused to move. Nearby was a pair of elevators. It took only a few button presses to determine that the elevators would not respond to their efforts. They could only assume the elevators were not powered. There was only one door left. Well, looks like we don't have any choice. Yeah. Sure does. Well then, let's open it. Junpei grabbed hold of the knob and quietly pushed the door open. He entered, slowly, trying to take in as much of his surroundings as he could. The others followed shortly. Oh, so it's a kitchen. Santa did not look pleased. What were you expecting? Isn't it obvious? The exit. I was hoping this would be the way out of here. <laughs> you really think it'd be that easy? Yeah, yeah, I know. Still. As they talked, Lotus headed deeper into the room until at last she stood in front of a door. If we can just get through the door, we should be able to come out the other side of that grate we saw earlier. But don't we need a key for that? Sorry, I guess that wasn't very constructive. Neither Junpei nor Lotus looked terribly happy. Junpei dug the ship map from his pocket and spread it out in front of him. As he did. Hey! What's that? Huh? Oh, yeah, I guess I forgot to tell you. I found this a little while ago. It's a map of the B-Deck. Before Junpei could finish, Lotus snatched the map away from him. She ran her finger across it, muttering to herself. I knew it. See? Look. Junpei did as he was told. Santa and Jun moved over to look at the map as well. See? We came in here. If we go out there, we'll be on the other side of the grate. With her finger, Lotus traced a path on the map. She was right. Satisfied that she had been correct, Lotus folded the map and handed it back to Junpei. He took it and slid the valuable piece of paper back into his pocket. There's a card reader on the right side of the door. Then that means the key card is somewhere in here, right? It that seems the most likely. All right, we know what we need to do then. Let's get moving. First off, I say we split up and look for clues. Okay. In a horror movie, that would be the worst decision, but you know what? Uh, since we're in a pretty enclosed space, I don't think anything is gonna actually get to us, so... Yeah, let's begin. First off, let's just click on things that we immediately see. A voucher. It says, Appetizer 9, Meat Dish 10, Soup A, Seafood Dish F. Those nine plates look pretty expensive. They're plates for appetizers. Remember, appetizers usually come on a square plate. Okay, okay. Well, excuse me, princess. I believe that's actually a reference to the 80s Zelda cartoon where that was pretty much Link's catchphrase there. One, two, three... There's ten of them. If you flip these over, they look like hats. The middle is super deep for a plate. They're soup plates. They're made that way so that the soup doesn't spill. If we ever get out of here, you should treat yourself to a nice dinner out. What makes you think a poor college student has the money to do something like that? I think there are fifteen of these plates. I'm assuming they're for seafood. How the hell can you tell that? They look just like any other plate from the 99 cent store. 
If you ever take a lady out to dinner, you're going to embarrass yourself. I feel sorry for June. <laughs> Why the hell are you bringing up June? The lady doth protest too much, methinks. You are not terribly subtle. <laughs> There's a bunch of little wavy ridges on this plate. Those plates are for serving meat. Ugh, you really are ignorant, aren't you? Come on, it's not like I need to know this crap. Jeez. There's a voucher at the end of the counter. This voucher doesn't match the number of plates on the table. It says appetizer 9, meat dish 10, soup A, seafood dish F on the voucher. And the plates on the table are 9 appetizer, 16 meat, 10 soup, and 15 seafood. Maybe they're using hexadecimal here. And hexadecimal is... It's a number system that goes 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F, 10, 11. You're familiar with base 10, right? That's the normal system of numbers. The base 10 equivalents for hexadecimal numbers would go like this. A equals 10, B equals 11, C equals 12, D equals 13, E equals 14, F equals 15, and 10 equals 16. And 10 becomes 16 in base 10. I know it sounds strange, but you can think of it just six letters added to the normal number system after nine. A equals 10, B equals 11, C equals 12, D equals 13, e equals 14, F equals 15, 10 equals 16, and so on. I think I get it. So that's going to become important for later. Uh, if we head over to this section right here and look down here, we've got a whetstone. A whetstone? What are you planning to do with that? Ah, shit, don't tell me you're gonna try and smash open the card reader. Are you an idiot? If you do that, we'll, then we'll never get out of here. Oh, yeah, I guess that would be bad, huh? The whetstone's only gonna be useful if I need to sharpen something. A whetstone, I could probably use it to sharpen a knife. Alright, moving back here. Uh, right over... No, it's right over... Right here, there's a door that we can walk right through. There are a couple of things that we could, uh click on right here. First of all, there's this knife. Perfect for our whetstone. A rusty knife. I don't think we'll be able to use it while it's like this. The knife seemed important, Junpei thought, but it wasn't going to be much use the way it is. It's futile. Futile? You know, a waste. Useless. Pointless. Oh. Um, any particular reason you wanted to bring that up? Oh, no reason, really. I was just thinking about futility. She wasn't making much sense. Junpei tried rephrasing his question. Why were you thinking about futility? At last, she answered. Well, it has something to do with the Titanic. The Titanic? Yep. Have you ever heard the story that the sinking of the Titanic was predicted? No, I haven't. What is it? In 1892, 14 years before the Titanic sank, a novel was published. It was called Futility. It was written by an American novelist named Morgan Robertson. The story was about a big cruise ship colliding with an iceberg and sinking. Of course, if that was the only similarity, there wouldn't be any reason to mention it. It wasn't, though. The name of the ship, its nationality, course, departure time, size, displacement, maximum speed, number of passengers and crew, the number of lifeboats, even the location of the accident itself, and the cause, and the location of the damage. Everything matches the Titanic almost exactly. It was almost as if he'd seen the whole thing happen. But this book was written 14 years before the Titanic sank. But that's not all. It wasn't just futility that predicted the sinking of the Titanic. There were two others, similar stories written by a man named William Thomas Stead. Both of them before the accident. One in 1886, and one in 1892. Stead wrote two stories that had striking similarities to the Titanic disaster. In one, two ships collided and many of the passengers died because there weren't enough lifeboats. In the other, a ship collided with an iceberg and sank. Hmm, I don't know. I mean, I'll give you that it seems a little weird, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't too uncommon for ships to hit icebergs back in the day, or even other ships. Right, I knew you'd say that. But, what if Stead had some sort of special powers? To be more specific, what if he had the ability to do automatic writing? What? Automatic writing? Wait, are you... Are you talking about that thing where someone says they're possessed by a spirit, and then they write a bunch of stuff without knowing what they're writing? Yes! 
What do you mean, yes? That stuff's a load of bull. Okay, so let's say, hypothetically, that automatic writing is not total load. These guys still couldn't have predicted the sinking of the Titanic. When this Stead dude wrote his thing, nobody had died on the Titanic yet. So if automatic writing is about being possessed by spirits of dead people, who the hell possessed him so he could write that stuff? That's not it. What's not it? Stead wasn't possessed by a spirit. He was doing the po he was doing the possessing. What are you smoking? William Thomas Stead was a passenger on the Titanic. He just wrote down what he saw with his own eyes. 20 years before it happened. He decided it was probably best to say nothing. What June was saying was insane and utterly absurd. If he tried to take what she was saying seriously, he'd go mad. Junpei smiled uncomfortably. Well, uh... Why don't we talk about this some other time, okay? Huh? But... Her voice trailed off and she glanced at the floor, troubled. Tap, tap. Junpei tapped Jun gently on the shoulder and awkwardly reached around her to pick up the knife from the box. So yeah, a bit more to, a bit more weirdness with June. I love how Junpei just completely loses his mind at the end. Is just like, okay, sure, whatever. <laughs> Maybe I'll use the whetstone to sharpen the knife. Uh, I probably should have examined the knife before I got it. Ah oh, well, the blade of the knife is getting sharper by the second. I should be able to cut something pretty good with this. Wow. It's so shiny! Did you sharpen it, Jumpy? Yep. Now we can use it to cut something soft. This knife is nice and sharp again. I could probably cut something soft with it. Okay, the knife isn't the only thing we're looking in here for. Uh, there's some cheese back here. Hey, there's something behind the cheese. You're right! Why don't we move some of the cheese? Alright guys, time to move it. June, June and I need to look behind you. There's a little green bottle back there. Bottle of oil. Oh look, cooking oil. You could probably use this to make something slippery. A bottle of oil originally intended for cooking. It also might be useful for lubrication. This bottle of oil is actually important. Also, I'm pretty sure there's a funny line where it's just like, there are a number of cheeses lined up on the shelf. This is Gouda cheese, the most famous Dutch cheese. If you don't cut open the casing, it usually won't go bad. So you can store it at room temperature for for quite a while. So we can eat this? Most likely. Uh, I'm not hungry. At all. I guess it's hard to get hungry in a situation like this. There's cheese on this shelf. Sweet. <laughs> I don't know why, but Junpei saying sweet to the amount of cheeses is... I don't know, it's just funny to me. Anyways, over here there's this uh, bolt that's stuck. The bolt is rusted in place. It won't budge. Of course! Maybe if I put some oil on it. Hey! Just a little bit of oil and... Come on! Come on, you little son of a bitch! Whoa! Huh! <laughs> yes! Gotcha, you little bastard! You did it, Jumpy. You're so smart. And now we can enter. As Junpei walked into the room, a blast of cold air washed over him. Almost instinctively, he folded his arms tight across his chest, doing what he could to conserve body heat. Ugh, it's cold in here. What is this place? Are you blind? It's a freezer! Santa's teeth had already begun to chatter. Hardly surprising. The freezer was far too cold for someone dressed as well, dressed as he was. Lotus, however, was in an even worse situation. Oh, no way. That's way too cold for me. I'll freeze solid in seconds. Sorry, but I'm afraid I'll have to pass on this one. I'm going to leave the rest to you. And with that, she ran out of the room. As Lotus left, June came in. Whoa, it's really cold in here. White puffs of steam hovered in front of their faces as they talked. June had already started to shiver. Hey, you don't need to be in here. You just, you had a fever just a bit ago. You should stay outside, we got this. No, I'm fine. My fever's gone now. But... Junpei had scarcely opened his mouth. When the thunderous sound of metal upon metal rang out from behind him. In unison, they spun around to find that the door that they had recently come through... ...was closed. Uh, uh, uh. Jun 
Junpei rushed to the door. Desperately, he grabbed hold of the doorknob. Ow! It was cold, beyond cold. Merely touching it was painful. The doorknob had been frozen solid. They quickly deduced that the pipe next to the door had ruptured. Water released by the rupture had hit the door and frozen instantly. Santa shoved Junpei aside and pounded against the door. Hey, Lotus! You're out there, right? Open the door! She wasted no time in responding. What do you want? What's going on? The door won't open! Try opening it from that side, please! Ah, uh, fine. If you say so. Hold on. Soon, they could hear Lotus on the other side of the door. And then the grunting ceased, and they could hear light panting as if from exertion. It's no use. It won't budge. You've got more people in there. You figure it out. God damn it. Santa was shaking like a newborn deer. June was hugging herself and was shivering violently. Even June Pei, with the heaviest clothes of any of them, was clearly feeling the cold. With every breath they took, they could feel the cold working its way deeper and deeper into their bodies. <laughs> Uh, anyway, let's find a way out. If we don't get moving, we're gonna be permanent residents. T -t -t Two heads are uh, are better than none. I I'm sure we'll figure something out. Y y yeah, y you're right. L let's just take a good look around this room, okay? R right. They pushed in close to one another and began to search. Now we're locked in a freezer, a pretty iconic set piece from this game. Uh, there's a floor hatch right down here. If we open that up, we've got a few supplies. Sturdy rope. It's a rope. Well, we could use it to attach something to something else, I suppose. A sturdy rope. I could probably tie things together with this. That's not the only thing in the floor hatch, though, so we've also got the water bottle. A water bottle? Yes, it is. An empty water bottle. The neck is pretty small. I don't think it, I could fit anything very big in there. Another interesting thing is right over on the shelf here we have another item of interest. This thing's frozen solid. This pork? Yeah, seems like it. What's with this thing? It looked like a tag. It looked like a tag or something. Indeed, we have a chunk of pork with a tag in it. Jumpy, is there a slip of paper in that meat? I think there's something written on here, but I can't read it like this. If we try and pull it out, it'll probably rip. You need to defrost that. Don't think we're going to be doing that in this room. <laughs> yeah. It's a chunk of pork with paper inside. We should be able to take it out once it's been defrosted. So yeah, nothing we can do with that. And finally, we have this uh, freezer right... Well, we're already in a freezer. So this is like, I don't know, just a storage unit. I'm not sure. Frozen chicken. It's really hard. It's frozen stiff. Hey, June, could you say that again? Eh? Say it again. It's really hard. Again. It's really hard. F thanks. Something wrong, Junpei? Your face is bright red. N nothing. I'm fine. If it's that hard, you can probably use it as a hammer. Yeah, good point. Maybe we could use it to break something. Ah, uh, Junpei, you weirdo. Jumpy, it's really hard. It's like a hammer. Maybe we could use this to crush something. Jumpy, your chunk of me. <laughs> it's rock solid. Maybe we could use this to crush something. Jumpy, it's really hard. It's like a hammer. Nom nom. Don't eat it. Maybe we could use this to crush something. It's chicken. Might as well be a rock, though, for how hard it's frozen. Oh my god. <laughs> and then last thing I think is right here, dry ice. Dry ice? Can't you make that stuff cause an explosion if you seal it in something that's airtight? Explode? Yeah, didn't you do that in school? You should never underestimate the power of expanding gas. Dry ice. We might be able to cause an explosion if we put it in something airtight and make it melt.
and Junpei picked up the dry ice with his sleeves as to avoid burning himself. Dry ice is just frozen carbon dioxide, right? Yeah, it is. I wonder how warm it has to get for it to turn back into gas again. Hell if I know. How's that gonna help us anyway? Oh, well, I figured we might be able to use it to get out of here. And they were about to move on when June spoke up. Carbon dioxide sublimation point is negative 109 degrees. Any warmer than that and it'll turn into gas. Any lower and it becomes a solid. Junpei looked at her dumbfounded. How do you know that? Teehee! Despite my looks, I'm the clean... Blah! <laughs> the queen of random knowledge. It looks bad to mess up when you're showing off. Out of mouth... Oh, you're so cold your mouth's going numb? Yeah. Ash white. Now you're just doing it on purpose, aren't you? June giggled and did her best to hide her guilt. At least she was still feeling good enough to joke around, Junpei told himself. Come on, guys. Don't you think that's kind of weird? I wonder why it doesn't turn into a liquid first. Santa was now shivering at an astounding rate, but his curiosity seemed unaffected. Junpei, however, was not in the mood to discuss science. He wanted out of the freezer now. His patience was wearing thin. How the hell would I know? And how the hell is that going to help us get out of here? We don't have time for this crap. Actually... Junpei stopped mid-sentence, surprised by Jun's interjection. Under enough pressure, carbon dioxide will turn into a liquid. This isn't really a good time for a chat about science. But I was wondering the same thing. Wondering what? Wondering why carbon dioxide doesn't turn into a liquid unless it's under pressure. Right? It just seems weird. Water's a liquid between 32 and 212 degrees. So why isn't that the case for carbon dioxide? H2O and CO2 are pretty similar. No, they're not. They're totally different substances. Look, guys, if we keep this up, we're going to freeze to death. You good with that? You want to die talking about sublimation and gases? Because I sure as hell don't. He fixed both of them with a glare. Now let's get back to work. Assuming you don't want to end up like a pair of ice sculptures. Junpei turned around and the problem dealt with. Or so he thought. There's a kind of ice that doesn't turn into liquid when it goes above 32 degrees. Huh? I heard about it. Its melting point is 96 degrees. Its melting point is 96 degrees? You mean there's water that freezes at 96 degrees? Yeah. Well, you could also look at it as, as ice that won't melt until it's 96 degrees. Water that freezes at 96 degrees. Ice that won't melt until it's 96 degrees. It doesn't matter. It was strange, but no, Junbei told himself, it didn't matter. Their first concern needed to be leaving the freezer, or none of them would be around to ponder scientific quandaries for very long. He did his best to pretend he'd heard nothing and resumed his investigation of the room. So we don't really get to hear anything more of them. There is some extra dialogue there that we'll come back for later, but for now we're just going to move on and try our best to get out of this damn freezer. So we're going to take the frozen chicken and use it as a hammer to crush the ice here. Alright, the dry ice is all in pieces now. So we're going to take this and we're going to place it inside of the water bottle. We're going to put these pieces of dry ice into the water bottle. Now we're going to take the water bottle, then connect that to this rope. And let's just tie a rope on here. And now we have a bomb! YouTube, don't take that out of context. That it's a water bottle. It's a bomb. It's not an actual bomb. It's a water bottle bomb with ice. Anyways, let's go ahead and attach it to this doorknob right here. Warm water dripped from the ruptured pipe near the door. Junpei pulled out the water bottle filled with dry ice, let a good amount of water fall in, and then quickly sealed it up tight. The makeshift bomb complete, he tied it to the doorknob as quickly as he could manage in the cold. All right, that's set. So, uh, what do we do now? We just need to give it a little, uh, tap. The bottle's already about to pop. If we just throw a rock or something at it, it'll go off all on its own. A small rock. Small rock. Junpei looked down at the floor. Scattered across it were pieces of dry ice left over from the larger chunk he'd crushed earlier. 
All right, this ought to do the trick. He pulled a sleeve down over his hand to keep from getting burned and grabbed the chunk of dry ice. It was a pretty good size, about as big as a pool ball. He figured it would be just about the right size. All right, guys, stand back. Actually, we should probably hide somewhere. Both Santa and June looked at him with new concern. Where exactly do you expect us to hide, genius? There isn't really anywhere big enough. Yeah, there is. Look, right here. We can hide in there. Junpei pulled open the door to the small cellar. Come on, get inside, quick. Santa and June nodded and jumped down into the hole. Junpei quickly followed. In his hand, he could feel the chill of the frozen carbon dioxide, even through his sleeve. He tightened his grip, took aim, and prepared to throw. All right, here it goes. Three, four, five. You're counting the wrong way. Oops. That is a really sad excuse for a joke, man. Sorry, dude. All right, for real this time. You guys ready? Yes, whenever you're ready. Just throw the damn thing. All right, here I go. Three, two, one. Junpei threw the chunk of dry ice as hard as he could. With that same motion, he ducked down into the cellar with Santa and June, just as... And Junpei leapt up out of the cellar and ran to the door. Jumpy, the ice on the door, is it gone? Yeah, it's gone. The blast must have shattered it. Yes, all right, let's see if it opens. Junpei grabbed the knob and pushed with all of his might. And the door gave way easily, and all three of them tumbled out of the freezer at once. Hooray, we're out. June, relieved, collapsed onto the floor. Move! Santa shoved past Junpei and ran straight to the grill, which he immediately grabbed. Ah! God damn it! Hot, 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 hot! Fuck! He proceeded to kick the grill in a futile but amusing fit of rage. But where was Lotus? It took Junpei only a moment to find her. She was sitting on the counter, idly scratching her chest. <sighs> Welcome back. I was starting to get tired of waiting for you guys. With a great yawn, Lotus lowered herself off the counter. Junpei clenched his teeth and walked toward her. What were you doing? What do you mean, what was I doing? I was waiting. We were gonna die! Oh yeah? But you didn't, so everything worked out alright, didn't it? What the hell? Just kidding. It might not look like it, but I was really worried. Don't give me that crap. I'm telling the truth. I mean, if you died, then I'd be in trouble too. If you died, then I'd be stuck here and I'd die too. See? I did all I could. I even looked around to see if there was anything I could use to pry open the door. But I couldn't find anything. So all I could do was wait. I mean, what else did you want me to do? Call the cops? It was true that there wasn't much you could have done, but something about her tone. Junpei gritted his teeth. Fine. There's one thing I have to ask you. What's that? You didn't close the door, did you? Ooh, what? You think I closed the door on you? Why would I do something like that? It closed on its own. I told you before, if I di if you die, then I die too. She was right and Junpei knew it. Without them, she'd be in very serious trouble. It seemed that an accident was the only explanation for the door's closure. If Lotus had really wanted to kill them, all she would have had to do was bar the door from the outside. And she hadn't. Well, she hadn't done anything. The most she was guilty of was laziness or negligence, not attempted murder. Junpei swallowed his anger and did his best to apologize. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I doubted you. Hmm? Oh, yes, well, that's alright, as long as you understand. Lotus looked away and twirled her hair between her fingertips. His vengeance against the grill complete, Santa swaggered back toward Junpei and Lotus. Hey, no more screwing around, you two. Break time's over. Especially for you, lady. You've just been sitting on that fat ass of yours while we were freezing to death. How rude. I was plenty busy. Yeah, yeah, how about you put all that energy into something besides bitching? Let's go. Ugh. Yeesh. 
Anyways, now that we've got the got access to both the grill and the uh, meat from earlier, chunk of pork, right? I'm gonna head over here and just place it on top of the grill. I guess I'll put this meat on the grill. Hey, what are you doing? What are you going to do if the paper burns? Come on, it'll be fine. I mean, it's not like it's gonna burn right away, right? We just gotta keep an eye on it and the paper will be fine. Well, they can argue all they want. I'm gonna keep an eye on this pork. Cool, looks like it's about time. I'm gonna try taking the paper out. Jumpy, be careful! Sweet of her to care, but I know what I'm- OUCH! See? I told you. Hey, what the hell are you doing? Hurry up and take the paper out. It's not coming out. The thing's frozen stiff. I can't get it out. So are we gonna have to cut the meat? Yeah, it looks that way. So, of course, we pull out the knife. And get to cutting. Alright, now that I've sharpened the knife. Yes, I can cut the pork. Awesome, Junpei. Now we can cut out the paper. C plus 10 plus F. Do you think it's some kind of code? Damn it, they're just screwing around. Junpei, do you know do you know what C and F stands for? You think maybe it's corporate it means corporate finance? I thought it was clever and funny. <laughs> I love whenever Junpei just screws around with people. It says uh it says C plus ten plus F on the note. Cause you can tell Junpei totally knows what's actually going on here, but he's just messing with her. Uh, pull out the calculator, you'll remember earlier with the uh, hexadecimal talk. Uh, C equals 12, plus 10, which equals 16, plus F, which equals 15? Let me... yep, 15. That gives us 43. So what we do with this code now is we want to head over to here, which we haven't really looked at yet, and we have this code uh, insert key thing right here. This is probably what you're supposed to use to enter the password. Maybe if we put in the right number, it'll open the oven door. Junpei, maybe the note you found earlier. Yeah, I know. Do you know how to enter those numbers? I think E is for enter and C is for clearing. So basically, when I'm ready to submit my answer, I press E. So if I screw up, I just press C, right? Lotus nodded. Alright, let's give it a shot. 43. Nice. Sounds like metal is falling. Well, I guess that went well. So now we can open up these doors, and... Yeah, the door opened! Good job, Jumpy! This looks like a lowercase h, but the line next to it is throwing me off. This is the symbol for Saturn. Remember? There was an elevator next to the main staircase. Wasn't there a mark like this on the card reader next to it? Oh yeah, I remember that. I guess that means that card ain't gonna help us get out of this room then. I'm not so sure. Why don't we try it out? A Saturn key card. I saw the same symbol on the card reader next to the elevator by the main staircase. This card might be useful here too though. Can't hurt to give it a shot. Saturn key card. Let's try it on the card reader next near the exit. Alrighty. Head back here. There's a card reader right over here for the exit. And what do you know? It worked. Yes! I think it's unlocked now. You did it, Jumpy. Let's get out of here. Yes! Let's go. Alrighty, now with the kitchen being completed, I think that's a good place to end off the video. Thank you guys so much for watching, and in the next episode, we're going to go ahead and continue searching throughout the ship. We're in a whole new area now, and there's lots of places that I can see just here that we can go search, like the staircase, and the hallway over there, and the door. There are many places we'll be able to search, and we'll have to see where uh, they end up going in the next episode. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye!